Thank you. So um, when I was maybe like nine or ten years old, I was uh, in school and we had this art class and we were looking at this picture by this painter Peter Bruegel. And he had this, this picture with this market scene. And while we were talking in, in class, we were talking about his technique and his intention to do this painting. I was interested in the stories of all those people that were in this picture. So after that, I went home and I started writing down like little stories about those people and their lives. What I saw. My parents were, I think, at that time thinking I would become like a famous writer or something like that at some point. And next Christmas, like all my relatives and aunts and uncles and grandma got like this little book with his stories. I didn't become a writer though, and I didn't really become interested in fiction, but I still work with stories and telling stories. And my work has taken me all over the world, more or less, but. The strong focus in the last years has been on Africa and has been on telling stories from there. And my tools nowadays are photography, is video, mainly video, because it's such a powerful tool, I will tell more about that. Um, and the problem that I encountered when working there is that our idea of Africa as a continent is pretty much like the idea of one country. Like you said before, it's like everyone has this stereotypical ideas. When we talk about Africa, everyone thinks everyone is poor, there is HIV AIDS everywhere, there uh, is famines, wars, whatever. You name it. I guess you all have like the, this kind of ideas or encountered that. And one of the big reasons for that is that we kind of simplify stories so much. And we had this or have this, this way of telling stories from there from a very much like top bottom perspective. We go there and we talk to people, but then we go on and we try to retell their stories. This is a picture from Rwanda, and for me that is more or less like kind of a picture for our understanding of, of the continent. It's a, it's a memorial site nowadays in Rwanda, maybe some of you know it was in 94, there was a genocide where almost one million people got killed. And at that site alone, it's a school, almost 50,000 people got killed. And why this picture, I think, for me, tells like the story of Africa is like with this painting in the back that has almost the shape as Africa, and you see this dead body, that is like how we look at it. So, but the, the problem with that is we, we use people in some way. We go there and we kind of ask them to tell, and then we go and tell their stories, we retell it. It's almost like going there and saying, in Africa, people are poor, and then you hear someone saying, yes, I'm very poor. And kind of getting away from this idea was something what, for me, was, was always what was driving me. What kind of how can we break the stereotypes and how can we connect actually with, with those stories and how can we connect with those people in a different way. Funnily enough, that's like a, a picture from India that's in Dharamsala, that's the home of the Tibetans in exile, of uh, the Dalai Lama living there today. And, and one of the stories at the time when I was there, one of the stories that was really sticking to me was a moment when the boy that, where I went like every, every morning, I had like my morning chai and he had this little tea shop there. And, and he told me his story and he told me this amazing story when he got, while protesting in, in Tibet, he got captured by the Chinese authorities and he got arrested and for three months he was in jail without any daylight and then he got set free and he knew that they would come back so he fled with a friend, they fled overnight over the mountains and now he was in Dam Salah and had this little tea shop. And for me the story was like from all what, what I heard there, that was the story that, that was sticking to me. So the kind of the reason why that is like that, I wondered why do personal stories like that, why do something like that really sticks to me? And one of the reasons was, it was like someone that was sitting right in front of me. I could hear him talk about it. I could feel it, what, what he had been gone through. But it's also, it's, it's a way of looking at stories that goes beyond this having like these different aspects of a story, putting it together, but it's really personal. It's on the level how we as people experience daily life. We live through life as like a series of a lot of personal stories. Having gone through what I went through and knowing, having felt what it feels like to die, 
and the helplessness, you know, of knowing that I was going, you know, just going away. I asked them, are people going to watch me die? What will happen to my children? Who is going to take care of my children? And all I was trying to do was to have a child. I wasn't doing anything. And if our counterparts in America and in Europe are having children safely, why can't we in the 21st century? I think it's a matter of priority and commitment. Women should not die just trying to have life. If I died, I would just have been statistics. And it's easy to talk about statistics. And it's easy to say we are reducing maternal mortality from 50 to 30. It's easy to talk about figures. But we are people. It's one life. That was from a film that we did last year in Ghana about we did it for the World Health Organization, so the topic was women's health in Africa. <laughs> um, so we knew we kind of had to simplify it somehow and find some focus to it. And that was Elizabeth, a woman that had complications while giving birth, and she almost died. And we did a documentary film about this, what does it mean when there is like no access to, to healthcare or like a very limited access to healthcare when you have to go through that. And why I showed you that was that I think this statement that she made at the end is such a powerful way to describe exactly what makes a difference between a personal story and hearing a story. She says like, you, it's easy to talk about figures, but we are people. And I think that is something what, what is staying with us. So, but those are kind of personal stories in, in a bigger context and, and related to certain stories. But I saw a lot about, okay, but still it's like it's their life realities are very far away from our life realities, what we live here every day. How can we even connect more? How we can find ways to connect to those people? And then I did one more or less out of, it's kind of like somehow a little accident. <laughs> um, I was in Rwanda and uh, teaching a workshop there, and in my free time, I just had this idea to just go out in the street and ask people, what makes you happy? What makes me happy? Just when I make someone else happy, I feel happy too. What makes me happy is uh, realizing my, uh, my ambition. What makes me happy is to watch movies. Um, music. Uh, sing, especially Catholic Church uh, songs. Yeah. That's really nice for me to watch more I like it. Yeah. Usually, yeah. Me, I'm happy when I'm playing with my computer. So that was just like a small bit from this film. And what this film, I think, does so well is that it's, it's something, it's a question that you can ask people all over the world. And everyone would have an answer to that. So I was showing that film a lot in, in lectures and all that after uh, I came back. And, and people came to me and said, like, this was the moment where I really connected and really felt this is like where build a relationship with, with people, and I feel like I, I meet them. And so we, we then thought about it afterwards, okay, what can we do with that, with that? Focusing on more on the similarities and focusing on something what is so broad that you can work with it all over the world. And what came out of that was a project that's called Humans. And we took that idea with these this questions, but extended it to 10 questions. And they're all like very general questions. What makes you happy? What are you proud of? What was an important turning point in your life? Things like that. And we took those questions and we traveled all the way through Africa. We started in Cape Town a year ago and traveled for half a year, traveled all the way through Africa. And, and people that we met, we interviewed with those 10 questions. And then we followed their daily lives and uh, filmed that and took pictures and then made little short films of it or did like little kind of presentations of their interviews with the pictures. And the idea behind all that was really to bring the similarities, bring, build like a kind of a human connection where we feel like this is something 
where I you know, can be asked and I will have an answer to it. And I can yeah, bring, it, bring it up. So what I want to share with you now is just like one example of, of that. Because I think like what, what happened to us also while we were traveling is suddenly we didn't have a story anymore that we were looking for. Normally when, when I go to a place, I go there and I, I get like told by, by an NGO or so, we need this story about HIV, for instance, and then I go and, and search for people and, and talk with them. But in that way, we didn't have that. We were just going and suddenly, like, every person was interested. Suddenly, we were standing there and just like, oh, yeah, over there, let's, let's talk to him. Just figure out what is his story, you know, what, what does he want to tell us? What is, like, what is behind that? And we had sometimes ex amazing experience of people that, that we didn't think that this would be the story, suddenly like a whole different universe showed up. So what I want to show you now is that is just one example where also the story in itself somehow, I think, like her answer just tells her whole story in some way. That's Utropia, an albino girl in Tanzania, and, and she is living in this small town quite remotely. And as maybe some of you know, it's like, uh, Albinos have quite a hard time in Tanzania. They get hunted, but also, and that was for her the main problem, she was lucky enough to be at a place where there was some awareness for her condition and, and she was not that much in danger, but still the health condition is like the biggest problem. So they don't have pigments or more or less in the moment she's in the, in the bright sun, her skin burns. And what, what she said in the interview was, I'm happy when it's cloudy, because that's the moment where she doesn't you know, have problems with the skin. She had to go from, from school every day at after school. She had to walk for one hour to get back home. So she was walking in the bright midday sun. So for her, it was a huge problem. And, and another thing what she said, you know, if she would have like one wish, she said she would like to have a bicycle that she can go faster. So the question is, I always ask myself, what have I learned on, on this journey? And I think like the first thing is personal stories are everywhere. We can find it here. There are maybe 150 people and there are 150 personal stories and maybe important stories for each one of you. That is just around the corner where, for where I live. It's just like a couple of blocks away. That's Holger, an old chair designer, quite a yeah, lonely old guy that is still working every day in his workshop and trying to create the perfect chair. And we just did a film about him uh, a couple of weeks ago. And why I show that is Holger was, because he, he's working alone and he's, he doesn't have family and all that, for him this opportunity to have people there that, that cared for him, that were interested in what he was doing and were listening to his story was something what for him was also so empowering and so uh, gave him so much that I felt in that moment I realized that and I realized that a lot of times also when I was in in different places in Africa that when you give people a voice in that moment and you give them the chance to speak out and make their voice heard you give a big gift but I think the thing that is maybe the biggest gift you can give I realized from from the work that I did is when you respect people and take them for who they are and don't come with an agenda to them and then really sit down and really listen to them, then you give a really huge gift, maybe one of the biggest gifts you can give to people. And that, for that, you don't need a camera. For that, you don't need anything, just your own curiosity. And that is something what all of us can do whenever we like. Thank you. <laughs>